Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I am one of your hosts, and I just want to say how ecstatic I am to come to you from Austin, Texas tonight. Um, I love this thing about our show is our guests come from all over, and I've been able to do these shows from all over, and I got a different background, and I might play with some light while we go because it's a new room. Uh, and I do want to say if anything ever gets glitchy on my end, that's why we have a team because someone will jump in and, and take it up. But so far, the internet's good. And I just want to say also, before I get into introducing Sensei Suino the way I always do, uh, also hello to you if you're listening to us on one of the podcasts. I haven't been talking about that as much lately, uh, but you might be watching this on YouTube later or live. You might be watching this on Zoom with us right now interactively, which is super cool. That's kind of our first choice. But also you might be driving along in your car, you might be in your kitchen cooking, and it's so cool to us that you're here uh, listening and taking part in this conversation, even if it feels one way. I know how podcasts are. It's like you're with the people in the room while you're stirring your uh, your stir fry. So thanks for being here with us. We're really grateful for that. And I just want to give that shout out to the podcast aspect of the show. Every week, it's my pleasure to introduce Sensei Nicholas Suino. And I give the basics, which they're not basic at all. He's an eighth Dan in the Ido. And I always say that so quickly. An eighth Dan is a rank that it was almost unheard of when I started martial arts. And I, I never want to take for granted what an achievement that is. And then a six stand in judo, a six stand in jujitsu. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm traveling and I got off the plane and I needed to get my juice up because I had a long travel day. And so guess what I did, Sensei Suino? I cooked myself up a little JMAC 18 in the hotel room and I, it just got me going. I had a quick shower. And I just want you to talk about that real quick because um, it's something we touched on when you were our guest. But uh, I want to say thanks for that because it made me just go awesome. I can drop down and get this done. And I can be juiced up instead of lagging. So tell us just for two secs about the JMAC 18 and how are you tonight? I am great. The JMAC 18 is six exercises, 50 seconds each, 10 second transitions, one, two, three times through for a total of 17 minutes and 50 seconds. You can come in, do the exercises, go get a shower, get to work, including transport time, less than an hour. When you have uh, exercise ADHD, as I do, not officially, of course. Uh, you need something that gets done fast. And it's everything from body weight to kettlebells to insanity of one form or another. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, yeah. I started doing it two, three years ago, and then I just uh, thought my students might enjoy it. And so now it's a, it's an internet phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. It's cool that you're in my, um, in my country. I know that uh, Canada is considered the 51st state of uh, the United States. Um, and also, I feel like Michigan is much more a part of Canada sometimes mm -hmm. than it is a part of the US, but who knows? Um, how's the weather down there? It's, uh, it's muggy in the best way. It's like a 36 degree, but it's not the same as a Toronto muggy. So I actually walked out of the plane and I was like, oh, I love this. I love this. You're in Austin, right? I'm in Austin, yeah. Yeah. Have you run into Joe at the grocery store or anything yet? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been out. I literally went to set to my hotel and did a little workout. Now I'm here with you. So gotcha. Great to I'll see you. I'll get more taste this weekend. Great to see you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So each time we do this show, it falls to me to introduce Sensei Randy Dauphin. And uh, I think virtually everybody on this call knows him at least as well as I do. Um, but uh, one thing you may not know is that back in March, uh, he appeared on another uh, uh, internet show uh, called The Master's Journey, which is... Uh, which is the brainchild of a, of a young man named Lucas Kramer. It's a really nice show. It's a very different feel than what we do here. Lucas is a really awesome human being. Um, and uh, the title of the episode that Randy appeared in is, There's No Secret, The Answer is Work. Mm. And in the bio, uh, it says, Randy Dauphin is a triple crown world champion in karate and has been obsessed with martial arts since 1989. The ranks he's currently holding are uh, seventh degree in Shoran Karate Hakutsuru, from uh, Hanshi Legacy, uh, Asandan, that's now a Yondan in uh, uh, Musou Jikiten Asian Ryu Iaido, also Shodan in Seite Ryu Iaido with the Canadian Kendo Federation. And um, in his 25 years of teaching, I don't know if this number has changed, but Randy's helped over 25 students achieve the rank of black belt, which I think is really cool. Uh, you guys are in the tradition called Legacy, and every week we seem to talk more about the legacy of the uh, of the of the tradition that you guys are involved in um, and uh, producing new black belts, especially ex excellent black belts is a really important part of that legacy. Last thing I'll say is uh, Randy trains and teaches. This is also from the master's journey. Last thing I'll say is that Randy trains and teaches karate five days a week and also enjoys CrossFit running, powerlifting, physical fitness, 
uh, and at a bizarre event we do once in a while called The Crucible. <laughs> Randy, it's so good to see you. How you doing? I'm good. You know, Benson always talks about how you and I have that friendly rivalry and it's like we keep going back and forth on the internet. We did that 100 push-up challenge where it was like we went back and forth maybe four or five years ago. It was like you would post that you had done like 55 and then I was like, okay, I, I'm going to do 57 and then you're like, okay, I'm at 62 and we kept going back and forth and then I remember uh, I my phone went off and I'm like, damn, I was not, I was sick and I'm like, he just did 100. I got So then I was like, Sammy, hold my phone, right? And I, I was like coughing and like, I just, it was the worst 100 push-ups I ever did in my life, but I did it right away after you because we were going back and forth. <clears throat> the other thing is, we really love the JMAC 18 here, but we, we've we rebranded it. We call it JMAC 24 because we just like to do one more iteration <laughs> of it. Because <laughs> um, just 18 minutes just isn't enough for me. I got to do 24 minutes. So I'm doing good. And thanks for that <laughs> intro, Sensei. <that's> <laughs> thanks so much. I, uh, it feels like forever. The other thing I want to thank you for is just uh, messaging me the other day, just randomly and saying, Randy, I was thinking about you and I really miss you. And that's one of those things that I say, you know, your real friends and the people who are really on the inside with you are the ones where you're not in their face and they're still thinking about mm -hmm. you, right? It's easy to think about the people who are in your face when they're not in your face. And, and you know, so it's, you know, I think about you all the time, probably every day, multiple times a day, actually. So thanks for that great introduction. I am so stoked about tonight. <laughs> and... I'm always excited to be able to introduce uh, Sensei Legacy. And, you know, he hates it when I go through the different accolades, but I always say, Sensei, you never know who's going to jump on this call and just watch one. So we always have to, we have to give the accolades, which is that Sensei Legacy is a 10th three black belt. And he was awarded that by his teacher, Anthony Sandoval. He's also a member of the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame, like Sensei Suino. Sensei Legacy is also an author of the LE fighter. In his years training, he's been a student of Harold Warden, Benny Allen, Richard Kim, as I said, Sensei Sandoval, and also actually a student of Sensei Suino's because he has a showdown in the Ido from Sensei Suino as well. Um, I always tell just stories that I've learned uh, from being with Sensei Legacy and hearing the stories and then other ones that I have. And about our relationship, uh, when I walked in the dojo, I just became enamored with Sensei Legacy and I became enamored with karate. And I just started doing it like all the time, nonstop. To uh, the point where when I went to my grading um, <laughs> in March, my mom came from Windsor to London to watch my yellow belt grading, which sounds kind of funny, but, <laughs> but she came. And then when it was all said and done, my mom went marching across this gymnasium and walked up to Sensei Legacy and said, you know, I haven't seen my son too much in the last nine months. Do you think I could see him once in a while? And Sensei so Legacy said, well, how about we share him? <laughs> right? that's, that's, what he, that's what he said to her. And then uh, it also came out in the last, uh, when Sensei Demuro was on, about um, it is 100% true that when I was married, my father stood up at my wedding and said, I want to thank Gary Legacy for helping me and Mary Lou, who's my mom, for raising Randy. And they're both gone, and he's still here raising me, so I'm really grateful for that. The kind of funny story I want to tell you about Sensei Legacy tonight is the story about him training with Richard Kim in San Francisco, and they were doing the tombo. And, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and, and uh, there's a lot of people in this room, like let's say 50 or 100 or 150 people, and the tombo is a short stick, and they're doing different things. And then Sensei Kim, Master Kim says, this is how you can disarm a person. And he wraps it and pulls and says, but I don't want you to do it because the stick can come flying out and we don't need 70 or so sticks flying around in the room. And so he said, go out and practice. And then of course, as, as soon as Sensei was with his partner, he did the thing that Sensei Kim told him not to do. And the tombo came flying out at about a million miles an hour. And Sensei Kim was looking, and the tombo just skimmed past the front of his face and landed on the ground. 
And then, of course, everybody, he knew who it was that had done it because Sensei Legacy was the only one standing there without a tombo. <laughs> and that's my introduction for Sensei Legacy tonight. How are you doing tonight, Sensei Legacy? Good, thanks. <laughs> I like sharing this history, Sensei. Um, <laughs> but now it's, uh, it's my absolute honor and privilege to introduce Sensei Bill Adams, uh, somebody who I've known for literally my entire martial, martial arts life. Like when I was a white belt, he was already a seventh degree black belt. Um, and the, the accolades I'm gonna mention as I just did in Ishin Ryu, he's a master of Ishin Ryu Karate, he's a seventh degree black belt. Uh, he was a student of George Inslee, but he's also trained with the founder Tatsu Shimabuku. Uh, he's a dojo owner. He owns Bill Adams Martial Arts and Fitness in Elma, New York, where they teach karate, kabuto and tai chi. As I said, he's a seventh man in karate. And since you know, you'll like this, he's a third man in judo. Um, and in Tai Chi, uh, he was also a member of the US national team that went to China in 1993. And uh, I'm gonna tell you now, he's an outstanding uh, Kabuto practitioner. I know firsthand. The, um, you know, the triple crown things that you mentioned, Sensei Suino, the katas, that I, the Kabuto kata that I was doing to win the gold medal uh, in Kabuto was his kata, Shinken no Daibo, the one that he invented, trained and, and taught. So on that note, he has more than 800 tournament victories. And he is also in the Ishin Ryu Karate Association. He is a world champion in fighting and kata. Um, he's an innovator. He's an inventor. He's an entrepreneur. He's done so many DVDs, books, and video promotions. Um, when I was skimming the internet today, I found an article from 1996 um, when he was a sixth in and he, at, he, he said this, um, the real test is not solely in the performance of technique, but in the ability to keep doing it amid all other challenges and obligations in life. And he's still here doing it. So that was in 1996. Um, like I said, I've known Sensei Adams since I was a white belt. Uh, there's such, such a rich history of him with Legacy Charm. Uh, since Legacy, I think you once went into a court with him to do Goji Shiho with Sensei Baron. And after you did it four times, he said, I know it now. And then he did it for you. And you were <laughs> like, okay, he learned Goji Shiho after doing it four times. Um, I was sitting here just the other day. And as I was talking to him, he said, that person behind you is doing a really good chinto. He said that because there was a class going on behind me. Um, at our tournament, he always comes. And mm. at our tournament, he is always the head referee for the black belts at the end. Always. And he always does an amazing job. And he is an excellent referee that referees all over the world. We have been to so many uh, trips to his dojo. So, so many trips. So many great memories there. Uh, I've had the privilege of teaching there with both Sensei Legacy and Sensei Baron. I met Hanchi Alan Sai there. Um, I want to just tell a funny story that uh, in a tournament once when I, I was fighting and I, when I got to the finals, and I'm not going to say I didn't like the guy that I was competing against, but I didn't really like that guy too much. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I hit him with a crescent kick and he kind of, he kind of spun out of the ring. And I remember when everybody came back in, Sensei Adams was the center referee, and he looked at me and he said, Randy, that was a beautiful kick. You know what we're going to do to you now, right? He said with a smile. And I said, yes, I know, Sensei. And it was five red flags all spinning in the air for contact and they disqualified <laughs> me. Um, but it, it was the best disqualification I ever had in my entire life. And I'm so happy that it was Sensei Adams that disqualified me. <laughs> And as I mentioned, um, he is the inventor of a kata named Shinkin no Daibo. And if you have ever seen that kata done by him or Sensei Baron or myself, you'll know that you have to be in extremely good physical condition to do it. And you have to train it for a really long amount of time. And one of the things that I'm really proud of is that when I would do that kata, I've done that kata now in Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, Panama, Okinawa, Japan, across the United States. And I was always proud to come back and send Sensei Adams just a little note to say, I did your kata again. I did it in Venezuela and I won. 
I did your kata again. I did it in Panama and I won. And I'm really grateful that he invented it. I'm really grateful to still be doing it. I'm grateful that I've had the opportunity to teach it to people. And I'm grateful that I've been able to do it all over the world. And I'm super grateful that I've always been able to mention his name and that he was the one that invented it. Um, because so many people walk up to me and go, what is that kata? Where did you learn that? How do I find that? Um, the last thing I'm gonna say about uh, sensei Adams is he's one of the few people who's not in legacy Sharner and who's not my sensei um, who have helped me like every step of the way mm. and I would say that people it's a very short list I would say it would be sensei Copeland sensei Sandoval and sensei Adams have been probably the for me personally the three most pivotal people outside of legacy Sharner who are not my teachers um, that have helped me uh, and I'm really extremely proud to have him here tonight on Punch Kick Joke Chat. And also just excited to see him and talk to him. I just, I always feel good when he's around and I feel good tonight because he's here. So that's my introduction for Sensei Adams. Thanks, Sensei. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping for everybody and then we'll jump into the meat. Uh, the housekeeping is really simple. Uh, first off, we're so glad you're here. And at the bottom, there's a chat button and that uh, Robert just pinged that. So you should have a red little thing in the bottom. And we want to have your questions for Sensei Adams. We're really excited to have you be a part of the show. And um, the other thing is you're listening to Five Adults Talk. If you don't like any of the content, so it goes, um, but we are very happy you're here. Um, that said, um, let's get on to it. Sensei Adams, how are you tonight? Uh, I'm great. I, I'm a little overwhelmed. <laughs> that introduction brought tears to my eye. And, uh, the, uh, I, well, the, the, the slightly bad I have at the moment, which is, I'm recovering from a detached retina surgery. <laughs> so, but, so actually, it's good probably that I'm getting some... Uh, uh, you know, a little watering of the eye. But that was a great introduction. I want to thank you so much, uh, Randy, and uh, you and uh, Scott especially uh, were so often at my dojo when I got a chance to train with you uh, up in London so many times and, and, of course, with Gary. I just want to say one thing. The, the first time I saw Gary uh, was, I think, at George Beatty's tournament sometime in the late 70s maybe 78 or 79, right around there. And um, I just, uh, I was just stunned. I mean, I think I've been asked because I, I've been winning a bunch of tournaments. So I've been asked by George to go out and do the point demonstration. I was doing slow motion kicks and putting them up on people's head and doing, you know, the different things. I can't even remember who I was performing with. And then, you know, uh, and then we went and watched the, the black belt fighting and Gary was fighting. I don't even remember who was fighting. But I've never seen anybody, you know, so explosive. And it's just like, I don't know. Remember, Randy, how you said that you weren't really happy with the guy you were fighting? <laughs> he did the crescent kick. Well, Gary's punched that guy's chest, whoever that guy was. I don't think Gary was too happy with him either <laughs> for some reason. And I still remember that thump, you know, just like, boom, you know, I was just like, wow. <laughs> he was just so explosive. And it was, it was almost like scary. So it's like, wow, who is this guy? You know, and then later we became great friends. You know, it's just like, uh, so, I mean, I was impressed from, from the first time, uh, you know, I saw him, you know, just completely impressed with uh, what a class act he was. And, and uh, but uh, just so focused, so explosive, you know, I, I just love it. Gary. You were incredible. I'm just looking up over here to Gary's face. He's not saying anything. He's not smiling. But <laughs> okay, I got a smile. That, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Hanji, do you remember that day? Do you remember which tournament he's talking about? I do. But you guys were hitting each other really good. <laughs> you know? Well, he he was just as bad or worse than, than I was. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. You guys, you know. Uh, it was some incredible fighting, you know, just like, wow, you know, and it was, you know, stylistically good, but also, I mean, there was just this, this energy that was just, oh, you know, just like, you know, it was chilling. Um, Sensei Adams, it's funny you say that about, you know, the, um, the, the feeling you have. I, there's two people on this call who aren't uh, legacy Shore and Reap people who I recognize within my first year and those first tournaments and it's Sensei Suino who did a demonstration and yourself 
who was always up for our Shi'i and I, I competed yes. the first year I joined. And I just want to say what a pleasure it is to have you here and, you know, yes. add on a bit to what Sensei said is that you've been a part of my martial arts journey since year one. And uh, some of our guests we haven't met and the other ones I met later on. So I just want to say what a pleasure it is, even though we've never connected a ton. You've been well, a face. That I, 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 I'm not, you're not just a face, but I remember you too. I, I've judged, you know, and I, you know, I, I watched you. So, I mean, uh, I don't know if we were, you know, we hung out or anything. I don't think we really did. Not but, so much, you know, Sensei, but it's a real, no, it's a real honor for me. Um, so I want to ask you, let's jump right back to the beginning, like we do with our guests, which is what was your childhood like leading up to the dojo that brought you into the first dojo and what kept you there? Oh, gosh, you know, I mean, uh, there were so many influences that, you know, I, I think I was always kind of interested, even before I took it. I remember 1963, there was a Elvis Presley film. Roustabout, I think it was the name of it. And I remember going seeing it in one of the big theaters uh, downtown or something. And uh, uh, I still remember uh, him fighting three guys in a parking lot or something. And then uh, one guy, you know, jumps back, you know, after he does a, a knife hand chop, hits the guy in the arm and hit, hits the other guy or something. The other guy said, jumps back and says, hey, he knows karate. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like oh what's karate <laughs> you know and so you know i mean i would only be you know eight or nine years old or you know at the time 63 so yeah it's like nine years old you know and so uh, it was kind of intriguing and uh i still remember uh some other you know uh different films like you only live twice and you know other things you know where you get to see uh karate and i got to see some people you know like ed parker on tv a number of times um you know even in the uh early days and you know then i got a chance to meet him later in life and you know a number of times same thing you know i mean um i was reading about chuck norris you know and then you know i, I chuck norris uh, i got a chance to you know sit with him many times and I met him, you know, when he was on a promotional tour in the area uh, for his first movie. So, uh, I mean, I got a chance to meet so many people over the years and, and uh, you know, I, there's some, you know, wonderful stories I can uh, tell. And uh, you know, Chuck was very nice to me in a couple situations. So, I mean, I, I can go on, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I first, I'll just say really quickly that, you know, um, I started taking judo at the boys club in like 67, and also I got together with five or six friends. Uh, a friend of mine, Mark Tsujimoto, his family had a, a Japanese grocery store, uh, but they also had um, uh, uh, different gifts and uh, a bookshelf from Kodansha. So there was this huge library right there and I'd be buying books every week and, you know, and uh, getting things, you know, all uh, along the way. And, uh, and then there's like five of us that got together and trained, you know, um, uh, and from out of Masayama's books, you know, and uh, then uh, we were doing, I still remember punching Mark right between the eyes and breaking his glasses. And, you know, I remember his father getting a little upset and, and um, uh, you know, at the time, kind of going like this, you know. Oh, these and boys. this was that period before you'd actually started yeah. trading formally. Yeah, this is 1967, you know. And, and we that's were, around the time know. you walked into that first dojo? Uh, well, that's, I, I started taking... Um, at the boys club, you know, okay. I started taking some judo lessons, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and doing that. And then uh, it was probably early 1968 uh, that um, I started training at World Fighting Arts uh, in downtown Buffalo. And I got a chance to train with a guy named George Inslee. And uh, World Fighting Arts was Ishino Karate, which, you know, wasn't as much well known. And it was mainly Marines who trained in Okinawa. And those were the ones who uh, brought it. And one of the uh, guys, Dave Rapp, uh, was one of the ones who uh, he had trained in Okinawa as well. But there was uh, some that went off to, uh, that were there and developed the dojo, and then they went off to the Vietnam War. Um, and so, uh, you know, I didn't see them again. Uh, just mm. saw them briefly, and they were gone. So you just so, got a taste uh, of that that martial arts <laughs> through uh, military tape vibe. Yes. And so there definitely was a, you know, a slight military vibe to it, you know, and uh, I will tell you that in the, in the dojo I was, uh, it's, uh, it was about a 30 minute drive into downtown Buffalo. It was on the uh, second floor. It used to be, I think, Arthur Murray dance studio at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, um, 
you know, it was, I still remember the classes, they were three hours long on Friday night. You got in and the, um, an upper belt took you through all the upper body exercises, all the lower body exercises and all your kata. And they also did stretching, warm up and extra workout things. Then um, there was a break and you had to wash the floor and, uh, and the locker room sometimes. And then, you know, as everything dried off, you know, uh, you, you do the, the main floor first and then uh, you do the, uh, the showers in the other area. And then we put everything, you know, wrung everything out and put it away. And then we went out and then often the, uh, the black belt would come out and he started, you know, uh, it'd be maybe one or maybe three of them. They come out and they take you into groups and then they work on whatever you were working on. Uh, and then um, three forms. And then the last uh, uh, hour, sometimes people would bow out or, you know, then they'd often have sparring and other activities, usually the third hour. And then that was every Friday night. So it was like a three hour, three hour class. When you walked in, you know, you'd come from the judo. Did you keep doing the judo? And what made you go, I'm doing this now? This isn't just something well, I'm checking out. I'm actually, I still did judo, out. but okay. from time to time, the, the guy was no longer teaching at the boys club. And then, you know, I mean, I, I did uh, in, I was a fairly good athlete. I uh, ran cross country and track and when I was like 12 or 13, I had an Erie County record that, you know, for I high jump five foot 10 for a 12 year old, you know? Um, so, I mean, I had some athleticism. I, you know, I uh, really, um, you know, I mean, I ran, I, you know, uh, uh, I have a nephew right now. Uh, my, my brother, you know, I mean, I, all my brothers ran and did things and my uh, youngest brother, his son, uh, uh, just ran a 337 1500 meter and wow. could have made the olympics but he overdid it just before the olympic trials um but he beat all the guys who made the olympic trials um and he was actually in, in the olympic trials but he uh he'd overworked but you know i we have some athleticism in the family you know so right on but i, uh, I should get back to you know the the, the karate and, and stuff and that is that uh, uh i you know, I started training. Um, there were long classes. It was enjoyable. I still did judo. I also wrestled in high school and was uh, a very good wrestler. I started late at it. I did um, judo um, when I could find classes, and but you had to go down. But you know, I was competing in judo and I was competing in karate, and I was winning all the karate tournaments. Um, I think I competed in Mr. Shintani's. I was like. 15 years old and I went in the men's adult because they didn't have a children's division. Sure. And this was, um, and, um, and I, I fought everybody. I think I ended up taking third. I, I lost a guy who was like six foot five or six foot six. I was probably about five ten at the time. And, uh, I was like the only guy who scored points on him, <laughs> but you know, um, and I, I, it was like a tie, a tie, and then he hit me with something at the end. I don't even know what he hit me with. And, and uh, I think I hit him at the same time, but only two judges called mine and, and uh, three judges called his. Um, and so uh, he won the match. And then, you know, uh, I, I beat the other guy for, for whatever. And I was like 15 years old, you know. And uh, so, so you I, felt like you were maybe a little tighter at the karate. You're, you're doing a little better at it. Is that what? Oh, yeah. I mean, that, you know, path? I mean, the, the judo guys said because I was skinny, I was, you know, tall and, you know, you know, I wasn't the right build for for the judo. Uh, I mean, I still, you know, went out and performed, but, you know, I would go to a, uh, I go to a judo tournament, and take third and I go to a karate tournament. And I take first or grand champion, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. so, I mean, you know, the, even, even the judo guys said, you know, stick with you know you're <laughs> great at, at, at karate stick with that you know and uh real quick before we move away from the judo because it sounds like you did um sensei suino i wonder if you and him perhaps knew any of the same instructors at the time because you, you you were playing by then yeah? I was all people from the buffalo area and they went out you know i'm sure um uh, uh professor ashita from um rockport is very uh, well known in this area and the uh, mel ginter was somebody who helped, you know, um, teach me, you know, from time to time when I went ahead, you know, he taught me in classes and seminars, uh, but he was from the Buffalo area. So I don't know if you know, but he ran the AMCAN tournament, which is probably the biggest North American tournament, um, you know, open tournament for judo, um, 
in uh, North America. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know. And I was always welcome there. And, you know, they asked me to judge a number of times. And I was like a side judge. But, you know, I wasn't a referee or anything. Never did that. I never, um, I competed in, in an under black belt there, but I didn't compete later. As a black was that belt. your circuit at all, Sensei Suino? Any of those folks? Uh, most of what I did was closer to home. We uh, yeah. competed a lot of uh, Michigan, uh, uh, Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin kind of stuff. Um, and I was a kid competing right in the, in the late sixties, early seventies. So, um, those names, uh, they may well have been in the same room, but I don't remember right them. Yeah. Um, Sensei Dauphin, you had some thoughts you wanted to steer us towards? Yeah. Just on the karate thing, uh, this show, the impetus for, for this show was, you know, for people to learn by listening to stories and conversations with different, uh, karate teachers and different karate masters. And Sensei Adams is one of those people where I've had the opportunity to um, hear a lot of the stories. And I think people on the call would value it and learn a lot from it. One of them is, uh, I know Sensei Adams, you spent a lot of time in Japan, in Okinawa, mainland Japan. And I'd just really be interested to hear the story about your interactions with Masoyama. And because I think it almost seems surreal when I think about it um, and how you describe it. So it'd be interesting to hear about that one, if you don't mind. Uh, I spent the summer of 75 uh, in um, Japan and I went with uh, my friend uh, Joe Jennings. Joe had a, a dojo in Rochester and he became Panther Productions later in life. And then he sold all that to Century. But uh, he did some of the first, uh, they did the first videos that were, you know, uh, and then as they were uh, uh, changing over to DVD and stuff, he sold the library to Century. But I, I still remember going over uh, with him and we spent a week in New York City and then we went to, uh, we were supposed to go to Okinawa, uh, but uh, Master Shimabuku died about a month before we left. And so we didn't get, and we were planning on training at, at the dojo. And he was probably in his mid seventies at the, at the time. Um, we had a, uh, but so we spent the summer in Tokyo and then um, to help pay to go to Tokyo, I did a bunch of uh, articles for official karate. And then when, um, uh, and I also did a few for Karate Illustrated and uh, which it just uh, was going at the time. It just started up, and then Black Belt Magazine, of course, uh, and did uh, some various things. And uh, I took a uh, in Canisius College. I took a uh, uh, a writing course, and it was you know uh, you could sort of pick your own things. And I told the the uh, uh, instructor, and there's like ten of us. I said, "Do you mind if I just write some articles for magazines?" And then you know I. I uh, sold about twelve hundred dollars. They're only about one hundred fifty to two hundred dollars a piece, but I sold about you know twelve hundred dollars, and that helped pay about two uh, about it was probably two thousand expenses that helped pay for it. But it was great also because it gave me credentials because I could show some you know some articles I did when I walked yeah. into a dojo and said you know can I interview you for this magazine, and then you know everybody opened their arms to us, which was really nice. And Joe took the photos and I wrote the articles. You know, and, questions you want to talk about Masayama? Yeah, just I remember when you talked about you had to stand on the sidewalk and you had to wait and then he didn't okay, come. Okay, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that story really quick. We, we did, um, uh, we went to uh, Mr. Oyama's school and, uh, you know, we didn't have an introduction, but, uh, you know, I, we took some, you know, some of the, uh, the things and he had actually, Mr. Oyama had, had uh, done some, you know, different clearly he he was not shy you know mm. he didn't mind the media you know and in fact uh, you know i think his wife worked for kodansha and he produced all those different volumes of some great you know uh, books and some of the first books uh, uh, on martial arts and karate and really you know they're spectacular they're beautiful books i have some on my shelf behind me but um uh you know it, to me it was you know it's like you, in 1967 i think you only live twice comes out and then eight years later, I'm, I'm at his dojo, you know? Um, uh, so uh, it was kind of interesting in that um, 
uh, you know, I was already starting to become really good at sparring. I was uh, uh, black belt already. I, I was winning tournaments and doing uh, starting to do really well. And, uh, you know, I, I went in and I watched um, uh, uh, the dojo. We were allowed in at first, but we weren't. We were asked, actually, we made a little introduction. We walked in. There was a staircase up. Uh, and the second floor was uh, the dojo and the third floor was his offices anyway, but we did it. In the, and then we were told that since we didn't have a membership, we had to stay outside and then someone come out to meet us. And um, anyway, uh, they came out to meet us. And anyway, he came, he invited us up to his office. You know, they had somebody uh, come up and there was uh, uh, somebody to help translate. And uh, we had somebody with us uh, that helped translate uh, for us. And, um, we uh, went upstairs and we had a long uh, conversation with him. And um, then he uh, invited us uh, back and we had a three hour um, a conversation. And I wrote a lot of notes. And then, um, and it was before a, a big championship that was a fairly famous one where he invited people over. Anyway, um, I still remember uh, going and, and uh, meeting. One thing is, uh, he had a higher voice. I expected a basso profundo, you know, and he had a much higher voice. You know, it was like a yeah, higher voice. And, you know, I, I didn't expect that. But he was very barrel chested, very strong. And he's probably in his 60s at the time. And I remember asking him about the Japanese team. The, I said the uh, American team is so good. And it became a movie that came out, Four Kings or something of Brooklyn. I can't remember what it was, but uh, they did... Um, uh, there were some very good fighters. I think it was maybe Joe Hayes or some other people were part of it. I'm trying to remember who the different people were, but um, very good fighters from New York City, and uh, and they went to uh, were coming to Japan. And I knew some of them from from uh, New York City, and I said, oh, you know, I mean, there's some fantastic fighters, you know, uh, uh, coming. You know, how, you know, how do you think the Japanese team is going to do? And he and he kind of looked me in, in the eye, and and uh, and then he said in Japanese, I believe he said. He said, um, if the Japanese uh, team is having a little trouble, I will take them, you know, kind of in the locker room and I'll give them some secrets and they will win. <laughs> you know, they will win. <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, oh, secret techniques. Oh, okay. You know, but very forceful personality. You know, it was very, very interesting and very, very proud. And um, I think, uh, you know, I, I just remember being in the, in the office and, uh, doing it anyway um i was supposed to come back uh, a couple of days later and this is the part of the story that you'll remember maybe uh and i was supposed to interview his top uh fighter and uh anyway um uh, it was supposed to meet him for noon and um i walk in and they don't allow me, allow me in the place it's very hot out, outside um uh, it's in the hundreds and um uh, and I, you know, I'm forced to wait outside, you know, and, and, I, and I'm kind of waiting. And, um, you know, I, I, on the way into the dojo, I, I had noticed uh, on the times they coming in that there was uh, people stationed down the block, one on uh, one block down this way, and then another one on the far end of uh, the other block. And they're and, and they're stationed there, and they were reading a, a newspaper. Well. Two or three hours later, they're still reading a newspaper there, maybe having a smoke, and they were still there like hours later. And you know, and then sometimes there was a different guy there, <laughs> and I was saying like, huh, you know, you know, oh, you know, <laughs> what are these guys doing anyway? Um, you know, I, I, I still remember um, you know being there, and um, uh, you know, looking down, these guys are doing it, and then one of the guys. Um, uh, down the block is, you know, like still smoking. And then suddenly there's somebody comes out of the dojo and he looks at me and he looks down the block and then he waves to the guy down the block. And I'm like, what's going on? And the guy down the block takes a few steps the other way and goes around the block and goes like this and starts waving like this. I was like, you know, what's going on? And then um uh, suddenly I hear this rumbling coming down the steps and these students come out and they line up between this, this, the staircase going up and the doorway and they extend out 
of the doorway and there's like, you know, like three or four outside the dojo and there's like five or six inside the dojo forming like a, a pathway. And then there's two really big students that come stand beside me, <laughs> like one on each side of me. And they're like, you know, like, and they're kind of got their arm out like this across between, you know, <laughs> so I can't move, you know, and I'm like, oh, something's going on. Huh. Then I hear a rumbling on the staircase. And, um, you know, and I, I'm hearing a noise and, I, and this car comes pulling up in front of where the, you know, the, the and so they're bracketing the, the, the back door of the, the, of the big limousine. It's not a limousine, it's like, it was a big car, which, you know, they don't really, you know, fit too well on most Japanese streets, but it was an American vehicle. And, they, you know, and uh, somebody pulled the door open and Oyama comes down the staircase. And as he's coming down the staircase, the students are standing at complete attention. And then as he starts coming down the staircase, they start going like this and go, Us! Us! and they start bowing. And then it's like like a, a, a very deep bow. I'm like, you know, like th this. And, uh, and so they're, you know, going like this. And then Mr. Yama comes, you know, down and out to the door and somebody opened the back door for him. And he starts to get in, into the, the car and then he stops and he sees me. <laughs> and I just had this long interview with him a day or two before. And I was waiting for, you know, this guy who was over an hour late. And, um, you know, he gets out of the car and he does speak to me in English. And he goes, oh, you know, how are you, you know, Bill Sutton? And, oh, I'm fine, sensei. And I bow to him. And he, he actually reaches his hand out, like, for me to shake his hand. And I'm a little nervous. <laughs> You know, and I actually do shake his hand. And then he, and he, he said, oh, he, forgive me, but I have to go to the airport or something. And, and then I'm like, okay, you know, and he says, but it's good seeing you. And then he jumps in the vehicle and he takes off. He didn't speak my very much. He didn't, that was like the most English I heard him speak, you know. Um, anyway, so the group of uh, students turn as the vehicle is going and it goes like three more blocks. And as they're doing it, they're all bowing as he's gone. I mean, he's going and they're still bowing like this, you know, like this until he gets and turns a corner and then they do a bow that's a complete, like completely in half, you know, uh, like this. And then they come up and then they go running back in the dojo, you know, and then like one of the senior black belts comes over and, you know, he starts, you know, like yelling at somebody. And, uh, and then the two guys that were beside me, they, they move in and then, you know, they like the guy like almost rough somebody up and they, they point towards me and then they pull me in. They put me on this big leather couch. They take this huge, almost industrial sized fan. I feel like, you know, the, the <laughs> one commercial, you know, like it's blowing on me like this and they bring me a Coke, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, and then the guy shows up like about half an hour later, you know, an hour and a half late, you know, and he's walking in like this. The fighter and it's like he just gotten up or whatever and you know and comes in and I have an interview with him but it was like and then you know I started realizing some things one is it just wasn't a karate school yet <laughs> there was more to it than that right. <laughs> you know right. uh, he wasn't just you know I mean he had a nice school and he had a lot of uh, uchidashi he said you know people who um I met who were from Hokkaido. They were farmer, you know, from farming stock, but they were big guys. They were probably 19, 18, 19. They, you know, they just maybe completed high school. They had no college or whatever. And their, their uh, Japanese was not polished by any means, you know, and these were, and there was like 30 of them there, you know, training, you know, and, and the thing. And, um, you know, and the training was was rough, and you know, and I talked to some of the like an Australian that was training. And I said, "Oh, you gotta don't let your you know you can't turn your back, and you know you, you gotta be careful." And you know, I, I remember being in the hospital. You know, you had to go to the hospital, and the hospital's nearby. You know, so because it was a pretty rough training, and um, you know, I suddenly realized that you know um, that there was more to it. The money wasn't coming just from that. You know, and on his walls there was pictures of him with. You know, Sako Sato had been the prime minister and a lot of different prime ministers and everything. But there was also, you know, I just had this feeling that he was like the conduit between Yakuza and, um, you know, some different, uh, different family or whatever of Yakuza. And he was one who would communicate between 
the, the help communicate between the different groups. And I think, uh, you know, if muscle is needed, he helped provide muscle. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but it's a lot of years later, mm-hmm. you know, so I, I think I can say it, you know, um, but yeah, there was more to it than that. And I, you know, you have to have a really good, you know, size karate school to, you know, to, to do the things, you know, have the lifestyle he had and everything. Yeah. You know, his daughter Grace was going, um, who I got a chance to meet, and my friend Joe Jennings, she was kind of, you know, smitten with him. Um, uh, and she was a bit of a wild child. She'd been in and out of a bunch of different, um, very beautiful girl, but, you know, uh, anyway, but uh, I will tell you that, you know, I mean, she was at some very good schools in uh, like Vermont and, you know, New England. And uh, that money doesn't, you know, was, wasn't was easy, you know, I mean, it was an expensive then. So I know there was more, you know, money in coming from different things than just a karate school. Yeah. And it sounds like he was just an intense cult of personality as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, which is, absolutely. I mean, you just expect that type of behavior or have that built around you is. Oh, yeah. I mean, know. I mean, that takes a lot of training. <laughs> I mean, I would just like, you know, I mean, yeah. oh. So real quick, when you talk about that being rough, I mean, you're coming out of the 70s heyday in in Canada, North America, as far as, you know, that military toughness. And, you know, we've talked with a lot of our guests, including Hanchi, about the blood and guts era, we call it. Right. And so were you fighting that way? And then did you find the Kyokushin stuff like actually? I I saw uh, I was watching. um, uh, I think it was, was it Maury uh, was the guy's name, but I, I was watching this top fighter and he's like six feet tall, which is pretty tall for Japanese. And he had very little neck and he was just like very strong, just like, you know, um, and I still remember um, a um, somebody who it was a foreigner, or maybe uh, somebody from um, the uh, Euro, uh, European of some type. I still remember he, he dropped his, he had his hands up like this. You know, and the Tokushin and Kai have their hands up a lot. He dropped his hand. He left his neck open on purpose. And anyway, so he let the guy kick him in the neck. And then he brought, as the guy kicked him in the neck, he brought his shoulder up like this and uh, caught the guy's foot, you know, between the shoulder and, and his face. And then he just started walking towards the wall. And then the guy's hopping on one foot backwards, you know, like this until he gets to the wall and then he just punches him in the face and the guy just slides down the wall and then you know <laughs> the, the 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 fighter walked back this is the guy i had to interview and mm. uh and he and he points at the next guy line says next and he comes like this you know and goes back and starts to, to fight again and this guy is just lying, you know lying there in a little puddle you know next to the wall so i mean yeah i mean it, it could be you know it definitely was rough. And I, I saw, you know, I was at the uh, Shotokan Dojo and I was there in the afternoon, the one, in, in, um, uh, it was in, uh, just off the Toyoka line, I think. And I still remember uh, watching uh, one of their top fighters and uh, he swept this uh, guy from South America. He swept him across the knees. They swept him not behind the knees, but to the front, just above the knees and took the guy, you know, like swept him out and, and the guy's falling, he's punching him. And, you know, just like, wow, you know, these guys are really rough. And, you know, and I still remember, you know, uh, saying to my friend, Joe, Joe, I'm faster than these guys. And, you know, I, I just was watching them, you know, beat up on some people. I, I, and I said, you know, I, I just, you know, want to, <laughs> I have this urge to fight, you know, and, you know, and, and just kind of show them, you know, that they shouldn't be roughing up and bullying people. And then Joe looked at me and, and just kind of shook his head like this. And he goes, Bill, you are faster than him and you are better than him, but there's five more guys, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you know, more people, you know, you won't make, you know, you'll, you may embarrass him, but that won't, that's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I go, okay. yeah. Uh, I've done that math. Sensei uh, Dauphin, I see you smiling and nodding when he talks about that leg back and hitting anything you want to add or, or talk about with that. No, I just think it's funny to think about somebody who's, yeah, I don't know, uh, on different levels or maybe it's not different skill level, but just a different level of, he knows he's got those five guys behind him, right? So he's kind yeah. of 
whatever yeah. happens, it's going to be all fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're, we're nearing our 10 question time, but I just want to ask real quick, Sensei Suino, does any of that mirror your experience doing Goju over there with Yamaguchi, Sensei? Uh, uh, I did very little karate while I was living in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it mirrors some of the judo training I did. Uh, there were some really tough guys in judo and they had a reputation, right? Um, usually deserved the, the clubs that I, that I trained in judo with. I was just lucky enough to be in clubs where a lot of college, you know, champions, medalists were, there were world games com com competitors and some Olympians. Um, and some of them were great technicians, but some of them were just bastards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that was entertaining I, and scary. I did, I did visit uh, the Kodokan and I, you know, you know, the little cubicles you put your shoes in as first time I went there and I saw shoes that were like size 13, 15. So, I mean, it's like, you know, as I said, you know, I've never seen Japanese with shoes like that. As I, some of them were foreigners, like, you know, from uh, Holland and places, but some of them were, were the, uh, were those guys. But can I just tell a very quick Gogan Yamaguchi yeah. story? I'll try and make it quick. Um, and that is, uh, I did meet Gogen Yamaguchi. I did have a long interview with him. I was with uh, uh, my friend, Joe Jennings. We uh, walked up, you know, uh, it's, it was almost like a little park almost that the, that the, the Goju uh, Hambu was. And, it, you know, you, so you walked up and then you, um, we started pulling. We watched a little bit and then as you started to leave, um, you know, we see Mr. Uh, Yamaguchi coming down in summer pajamas, a very light linen pajamas. And he comes down and he's going to the refrigerator, pulls out a watermelon and is cutting it. And Joe's like waving to him, trying to get his attention. I'm like, I'm kind of embarrassed, but you know, and then, you know, and Mr. Yamaguchi goes, you know, like this and, and goes like this. And he goes, you know, he goes through the, through the door and that comes right out into the dojo, you know, it's just right off the dojo. And uh, so we go, you know, back in the dojo and um, I'm, uh, uh, standing here looking uh, at the students who are lined up, you know, and sitting on the floor and they've been demonstrating kata and stuff and, and doing some things. I think one of the daughters was there and uh, Joe was here and Yamaguchi comes here and my friend Joe uh, starts talking. He's talking really fast in English. He's saying, well, where are they from and what we're doing? Da, da, da. And all the time, you know, um, Master Yamaguchi is going, oh, so this guy. Hmm. Ah, oh, so this guy. And just like getting a little closer and going like this and just stroking his beard and whatever. And I'm standing here and I'm looking at the students and they're all going like this. And Joe keeps talking, you know, and, you know, and I'm like, you know, like, what's happening? And then I realize that they're saying he doesn't speak any English at all. None. <laughs> and Joe keeps talking. And I'm trying to like tug on Joe's sleeve and Joe keeps going. <laughs> and then, you know, Ah, oh, so this guy, you know, for, for minutes and, stuff. and then, you know, it was just like, I just like, oh, you know, finally an Israeli came over um, and he spoke English and uh, uh, helped doing the translating. We had a nice interview with him. Um, and that uh, I still remember uh, also, uh, I brought up uh, Peter Urban, who I had met, you know, in New York and, and whatever. And I brought up uh, his name, you know, to uh, Master Yamaguchi. And suddenly his eyes got like this. Oh, one other thing is, I said, Domo Arigato goes up. I didn't quite use a, quite the strong enough honorific. And I saw Master Yamaguchi's look go like this. And then I realized I hadn't quite said as much as I should have. Should have. And I would just realized, oh, you know, this is somebody you don't try with. He's, not, he's used to being treated a certain way. And I still remember saying something about Peter Urban or you know, you know, what he thought of Peter Urban. And he goes, Peter Urban, he crazy. <laughs> like this, you know. And it's like, oh, well, that's how you feel. <laughs> you, know, you know, and also I expected a, you know, again, he was the guy I expected this deep voice out of. And you know, he had a very high, you know, uh, high pitched voice. And you know, but I was watching all these people and the energy. Uh, you know, he was again, you know, you could tell that there was a, a dignity and strength about him that that uh, was uh, amazing, you know, and, and everybody treated, you know. A different way of treating him than, than you know Masayama, but still the you know the sense of dignity and stuff you know was there. You know Bob Tayani uh, from New York City, you know uh, made 
helped make some introductions to some Japanese and also uh, uh, Lopez uh, from Brooklyn uh, helped make some uh, introductions for us. So, uh, and, uh, so anyway, so there, there, there are some stories for you. I hope, I hope they're interesting. They're great. And I, and I do want to ask you about some of the interview stuff, but, but for the next little while, I want to make it all about you, which is the 10 questions. And then I have a, a question that I'm sure you know is coming. Um, so the 10 questions is something we ask every one of our guests. We ask you to answer as impulsively as you can and then elaborate as you wish. Okay. So the first question, what is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Um, I will tell you that uh, I thought about uh, pressure points and I listened to George Dillman and other people and I talk about pressure points. I believe there is an important pressure point and I believe it's in the back right about here. Okay. Uh, Sensei, can, you, Sensei, can uh, you angle your camera down a bit? You know, we, yeah, I'll, I'll just go like this and I'll go, it's right about here in the back and the best place to reach it is through here. <laughs> And you try and reach through the guy's body with your punch. You know, and I learned this from a guy named Legacy, that that's <laughs> probably one of the best, <laughs> best techniques, you know, best pressure point hits that, you know, it's, it's a sure knockout. You know? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> who's the most influential martial artist John, in I'm, your life? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Interrupt. Yeah, you got to angle your camera down. So I'm just turning that down. I just yeah. back okay. down. Okay. Um, Sensei, who's the most influential martial artist in your life? Oh, my God. My instructor was, uh, you know, it inspired me. Uh, George Inslee uh, was probably uh, the most inspirational. Uh, but I got to tell you something, I've had some great coaches um, and a great uh, sense of competition with other friends. My friend Caesar and a lot of the guys, we used to train uh, Gary Hales, Bill Baisley. Uh, I'm just trying to think of all those, like five or six, Steve Ruthless. Uh, we used to get together and we uh, they come to Buffalo or I go to Hamilton or I go to Burlington or I go to uh, Toronto and we train really hard for two or three hours. Um, sometimes we uh, go to a strip club in uh, I think Zanzibar or, hey. or some <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, but, but I've actually allegedly was, been there. Yeah. And what was it, silver rail or something? Was I don't know. Brass rail. Brass rail. Brass rail. Yeah, brass rail. But you know, and but actually, there was always acts. It was sort of like watching flash dance. Not you know. Uh, it, oh yeah. It was always. I only I mean, the art. It, was, it was high class actually. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, and always started with clothes on. And, you know, and uh, uh, and. Uh, it was uh, it was watching the dancers, you know, they were dancing, you know, so it was it was uh, kind of fun. But, you know, we'd drink and we'd have fun, but we trained really hard and we you know, we just call each other early in the week and then we meet up later in the week and uh, and we'd all go out and train. And that was, you know, um, uh, my first black belt married one of Caesar's first black belts. And, um, uh, you know, we stood up at the wedding together. It's like 79, I think, or, you know, 80 and, uh, you know. It was from that point on, you know, I was very tightly interwoven there. So, uh, and, you know, it's Shinken no Daibo, you know, uh, why I had to put that together was because Caesar took a Kwando form and some other forms, and uh, he put together a, a form that he started competing with, and suddenly he was winning all the time in that. So I had to take um, three uh, forms that were from a Taira Shinken um uh, lineage, you know, and I uh, took uh, sections of each and put them together to create the uh, Shinken no Daibo. Well, we're going to crack that open in a sec because that's a, that's a topic I really want to get into. Um, but I really love the way you just took the influences of your contemporaries as well as your instructor. Who do oh, you yeah. think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Oh, I don't know. But can I just mention one other name? Uh, Chuck yeah. Norman. Who's not fit? Uh, who's uh, in a little bit of rough shape at the moment? Um, you know, uh, for about four or five years, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, we were like a, a tier of people that were outside of the New England area, uh, and uh, he had an influence on me. He helped teach me um, the uh, most of the upper Goju forms, and uh, and I enjoyed uh, working with him on them. Um, uh, you know, he taught me, because uh, Ishinu has 
an OG form, so it only has a few of them. I learned, you know, most of the other ones from him. And uh, he also gave me some great, you know, tips on inspiring and also the politics of things. You know, uh, so, I mean, he was a, a, a nice influence. And, you know, I, a couple of times I, I beat him at like at Caesars tournament, you know, I took first and he took second, and then, you know, and, and vice versa a couple of times, um, you know, but uh, it was lovely, you know, uh, competing and having him as a coach at, at different points for some competitions. That's great. He's been a guest on our show as well, Sensei. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. I didn't even know that, but he, yeah, yeah, we, had, he, we had a wonderful chat with him. Yeah, he, he's a, a good rock and tour uh, himself. Yeah, yeah, it was really lovely. Um, so who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Wow. You know, um, you know, I, I uh, that's really hard one to, to say, you know, uh, the people, I met. You could say Sensei Legacy if you want. Sensei. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> I would certainly say in uh, in uh, between uh, uh, Guelph and uh, Sarnia, I would say there's, <laughs> you know, maybe uh, maybe you know, certainly he's he produced some fantastic people in that uh, Southern Ontario region. That's for sure. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I can't say who, who it all depends on, on um, uh, you know, for Canada, for the U.S. I mean, there were so many really important people, you know, uh, June Ree, who I met a number of times and all the people he produced, you know, was, was uh, very important for the U.S. and for uh, Taekwondo. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the general, uh, the general and uh, part of Jong Su very important for you know uh, men. I uh, Masuyama, he had a huge organization. I mean, uh, at one point, uh, and a, quite a, a cult and uh, almost following. And uh, I think he inspired a lot of people. And, and uh, you know, I, I never met Bruce Lee, but I you know I know uh, you know I met Bob Wall. I knew a lot, you know Wally J. Oh, what a what a wonderful mentor to me for years. Um, he came like almost every year for about 12, 14 years, uh, sometimes every other year. And um, I would take him around or have a student take him around to Ohio or West Virginia or other parts, Syracuse or um, whatever. And uh, then he spent, you know, a lot of time teaching at my dojo. And then just, we just hung out and he gave me, you know, he said, buy real estate though. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, uh, he, he, uh, he was like a father figure in many ways. So, I mean, there's a lot of people who have influenced me that uh, have been very important. And Chinese martial artist, my friend Nick Grayson, I cannot say enough about him. And uh, Bosa Mark, uh, who was his teacher and who I've trained with many times uh, for uh, Chinese martial arts. And her son is uh, uh, Donnie Yen. And I first met him when he was nine years old, huh. you know. <laughs> And, you know, and, uh, and she was just coming over. That was the, the, uh, maybe the mid seventies as well, uh, early to mid seventies. So, I mean, you know, I've been very lucky to have uh, been around a lot of different, you know, uh, people in the martial arts. And when you suddenly realize how big the martial arts world is, you know, I, I mean, I can't name one, I mean, Bruce Lee, you know, you know, I cannot tell you being in a, a movie theater, you know, in the seventies, um, uh, watching, I'm surrounded, um, by mainly a black audience and they are just going crazy over his, his films you know and it's just like you know and you know i'm just like oh <laughs> you know I mean, it, the electricity i mean uh you know that he ins and inspired and you know i mean then all these you know all these guys are you know world fighting arts is taking off and it's, it's getting uh, big in buffalo and i'm watching you know i saw it in, in dc at a, at a you know and some of his films and, just you know the sheer energy that that he brought to the screen and what he could do, and then you know he inspired people. It was phenomenal. So I mean, who who do I say was the most important martial arts? I can't say, but there's been so many great influences. Chuck Norris. I mean, look at what Chuck has as, as wow. a body of work, you know, and um, and what a wonderful man. I will mention one thing. A, a friend of mine from uh, my sister passed away. And uh, he was having a staff meeting and Chuck led a prayer. 
I was. Completely overcome. Anyway, <laughs> ask you another question, quick. <laughs> All right, I will. Thanks for that, Sensei. What excites you most about the next five years of your training? Uh, I am going to get, I just had a hernia done and attached retina, and I've got a hip that I would like to get replaced. After <laughs> that, I feel like I can uh, uh, go back at it as hard and heavy as I, I used to, at least for a while. And that should be. Uh, a pleasure. Yeah, you got the old uh, car re restored. You know, I actually, it was only like, it feels like five, six years ago, I had a, a two, three hours uh, fighting seminar with uh, with Master Legacy, and I felt great sparring for two or three hours. You know, uh, I can still go out and spar. I feel comfortable going out for 20, 30 minutes sparring, but, um, you know, uh, the kicks don't go where I tell them to. I used to be able to uh, warm without warming up, kick people six foot seven in the you know in the center of the forehead mm -hmm. with a hook kick. But you know, uh, you know, and I also used to have full splits, but I, I can't do that now. My hips are. Uh, it was uh, a small period where I was teaching suddenly nine classes some days, you know, and I was teaching at a senior and I was warming up and doing it because it was because uh, some I had some staff that couldn't do what they said they were going to do. Something somebody went off to. Um, to grad school and somebody did this and somebody got, so all the people I lined up weren't able to do it. So I was doing it all. I felt great for nine months. And yeah. then, you know, suddenly the hip, you know, said, you know, you're, you've done too much. Um, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? Oh, uh, great job. You know, I, I will tell you something that, that I feel really good about in my life is, uh, I know Gary must feel it too. We've given discipline, self-discipline and encouragement. You know, we're, we're closer to Miyagi than uh, the Cobra Kai, <laughs> you, know, you know, as far as, you know, the type of instructor. I mean, we're firm, but, you know, we're giving, you know, people, we're, we're really inspiring and teaching people. And um, some people have really gone on and done great things with their lives and hopefully because of us. I love that. Um, do, and you touched on this a little, but uh, do you have a favorite film and television martial artist? Oh, wow. Um, oh, I mean, uh, there are, uh, are so many good people I, uh, and some great um, ones. I, I, some of the new ones out of uh, Thailand and some of the, uh, the Tony Jaa ones, I mean, he was uh, exceptional. Uh, you know, I, I loved, you know, the Bruce Lee movies. I loved, uh, you know, uh, you know, Chuck Norris and a lot of things. You know, uh, uh, he wasn't flashy, but he was just strong. And, you know, I did see him uh, at some points, and, you know, in his heyday. And uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know, had a, um, uh, had a, uh, uh, some of his first films were very inspiring. You know, those that first uh, five to you know eight year period. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's you know now uh, he's still making movies, he's still making money, but you know it's just like uh, you know they're usually straight to DVD or mm. or, uh, or streaming services. You know, um, but if is there a martial artist living or dead in all of history that you would want to train with the most? Wow. Well, I would love to have been trained like Alexander the Great. I would have mm -hmm. loved to have seen that that time period of, what, of, of how they fought and what they did. You know, uh, clearly, you know, uh, it, there was there was something going on. I think at every point in, in human history, there have been great fighters, and I think there's been a great warrior discipline. And I think you find that in so many different you know uh, cultures. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I saw an interesting film a while back about Taiwan and some of the uh, headhunter people that were still in, in the center of Taiwan, you know, even in the 30s and the 40s, and, you know, mm. and fighting against the Japanese who had taken over Taiwan and um, uh, Japanistized it. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I've just, uh, I've watched martial arts through many different phases. Um, you know, judo was really popular in the 50s and 60s, and it was more so than, than karate. And suddenly karate became, you know, 
you know, the martial art, you know, the most important thing. And, oh, uh, I just lost you there. Now I got, got you, Sensei. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, the um, then suddenly Kung Fu in the early 70s, you know, exploded and yeah. became something. And then sport karate became huge. And then Taekwondo, um, you know, um, all these, you know, Korean instructors came over, um, you know, and then, uh, then you know, there was all this fighting and all this, you know, infighting. And then I watched, you know, and then, you know, I mean, I was always, you know, I tried to go to the Korean tournaments and try to win and, and do whatever. It wasn't always easy. The, the judging wasn't always, uh, you know, it was hard to win in, in, in the, under those circumstances. <laughs> but, you know, um, but all those guys, you know, uh, from Park and from other places, when I kicked them in the head and then I didn't get a point, they just kind of like, they, you know, would walk over to me and later and say, uh, Bill, you know, you know, I'm so embarrassed, you know, <laughs> you know whatever. But, you know, I, but they all became good friends. And, you know, I fought, you know, Alphonse Gabby Don beat them for a grand champion. And, and uh, um, you know, Case Kukins and all, you know, I mean, all the, all the guys in there became friends, you know, uh, Rich uh, Paris, not so much. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was actually at Park Jong Su's dojo and, and Mr. Park was uh, hitting the bag. And I, I watched him and I was like, oh, I hit that hard, you know? And then he kept hitting the bag and hitting the bag hitting the bag and hitting the bag and it's like 40 minutes later you know and then you know i'm sparring and one of the guys is uh, uh rick paris and and uh uh and he was pretty full of himself and you know whatever and uh, he was hitting me some kicks and doing whatever and I, I was kind of clashing with him and hitting him and stuff oh you're not allowed to break my balance or whatever you know he said in, in a style or whatever you know or, or, and i was like oh Thing, you know and then he was doing some things and i still remember grabbing him and pulling him <laughs> and punching him and you know and sweeping him and, you know, and doing, oh you're not allowed to, to do that and I said, oh my style we're allowed to do that <laughs> you know and i was watching mr you know master park kind of just smirking like you know, and holding like this and then he walked kind of walked out the door and you know, it didn't protect Rick. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and that was it was kind of, kind of uh, that was kind of funny. And and uh, uh, Bob Heiser from Buffalo took me up a number of times, and I got a chance to meet everybody. Uh, and he was very welcoming to me. It was very nice to everybody. Every for some reason, you know, I I felt very comfortable going to and to most dojos, and everybody was very uh, uh, polite. And you know, and I got a chance to spar a lot of people. Do a lot of things on it, you know. I, I was always polite. Um, I you you may have touched on this also, but if everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what would that benefit be? Uh, you know, uh, get knocked down seven times, get up eight. You know, that's so a Kyokushin Kai one and a Japanese one, and that's uh, perseverance and uh, and endurance. You know, I think those are very important, and uh, you know, you never, you're, you're never ever defeated. You just temporarily, you know, you got to take a moment to get out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So and and uh, brush yourself up and and get back into it. I think that's you know something, and I'm I, you know, I was never afraid of anything. I find a way of tackling you know something, and that you know that come over you know a, a sense of picks. Of, you know, I own a building. Uh, now and it was all because of, you know the martial arts was doing well. It's twenty four thousand square feet, so it's not a main thoroughfare, and uh, things are going up around me. And uh, there's a new, uh, very big, you know, place going down the street, and all these stores and shopping centers are now surrounding me. And you know, something that I bought for five hundred twenty five thousand, they sunk another three hundred and fifty thousand in. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, last time was appraised five years ago was maybe a million two. Hopefully it'll be two million by the time I retire and I can, you know, but in the meantime, it's been very difficult. I mean, you know, there were some very difficult times and, you know, I, I had to, uh, you know, austerity and, and be careful sure. with spending and, and do whatever. But, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, when I do retire, I'll be able to travel and see my friends up in uh, London, Ontario a lot more. Okay. You don't have to. You don't have to spend any money to come and stay with us, Sensei. No, I, I know. <laughs> uh, the last two questions come as a pair, 
Greatest achievement, greatest regret. Oh, um, gosh. Um, greatest achievement are, are some of the, the students I produced. I have a, a, a student, uh, Mike Downs, he's doing great. Some of you might know Mike. Um, he's, he's got a very nice school. He's doing very well. I've got some, you know, other people I produced over the years uh, who've gone on. Some are, you know, I got one guy who was an instructor for me, uh, uh, Cole Rako. He does more Brazilian martial arts now, but um, he, uh, you know, he had a great attitude, great uh, spirit, and uh, you know, he's very well to do now, and, and he's a great family man. I think I've hopefully inspired people to do well with their lives and um you know i've inspired people to you know continue on with educations you know uh aspire to try things and do things and and uh, become something you know whatever they you know whatever they believe in and, and uh, take it somewhere yeah and greatest regret uh greatest regret um uh, that I didn't always, you know, uh, do the smartest things. Uh, I didn't notice, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, I had uh, somebody who was an office manager steal from me for three or four years. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was uh, took the first ten percent of my money coming in <laughs> uh, that I didn't notice it sooner. Yeah. Um, and that uh, caused, uh, you know, some things in my personal life where, you know, I just felt very uh, down. And there was a relationship I let go of. Um, you know, there's some, you know, but, um, you know, things are, are doing well and, you know, I, I, I'm happy. So I think I don't regret too much because they wouldn't have brought me here. You know, I mean, those uh, either mistakes or, or detours. You know, um, you know, uh, you learn something from, and and uh, and make it doesn't you know kill you, so it makes you stronger. You know, and I know you, you know in your life, I know that there's opportunities that popped up and ones that you wish you'd had, you could have taken, and uh, you missed them. Somebody else got a role, or somebody else got something, and you know what? It popped out, and now you got this other role and this other thing that that popped up. So. Uh, you know, you can't get locked in those regrets uh, because if you do, you uh, the negativity is going to uh, sap you and, and leave you uh, vulnerable. You have to bounce back, and you know, as I said, you're knocked down, you get back up. You know, I think it's that's probably one of the most important lessons, and hopefully, I've given to uh, some of the people here. So, I, I appreciate that. And that, that is true for me. Um, be, before we jump to uh, one of the questions that's come in, uh, right before you talked about it, uh, Cesar Burkowski, I call him Hanchi, uh, he said maybe ask Bill about when Madhu Lodia married his first black belt, Kathy Koch, we share some interesting history. And then you said it and talked about it. So you and he were thinking the same thing at the same time. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I still remember, uh, you know, there's three of us, Bill Fry and uh, uh, Caesar and myself stood up, you know, we were the best man. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I still, you know, we're, we're still close to this day and we've had lots of, I mean, I cannot tell you some of the great fun and opportunities and hard work and how much sweat we, we had, um, uh, and that helped develop us. And, you know, we, uh, we didn't, you know, uh, we weren't antagonistic, but we were often, you know, we work to get, you know, brush each other. But, oh yeah, you did this well. I can do that. Oh yeah, yeah, well you can do this well. I can do that. You know, and you know, inspired us to to take things to new levels. You know, I, the guy I felt, always felt um, sorry for was Mike Bernardo, who it was Caesar and I were always first and second, and Mike Bernardo for like five years was third or fourth place. <laughs> and then you know and then uh, you know when we sort of retired pulled away or did more things we were doing more things with the dojo and stuff suddenly mike you know just boom he was you know he was uh extraordinary right on and uh but uh and then i hopefully we were uh were some of the ones that inspired him um so this is a question that's been hanging in the air for the evening for us you know sensei <laughs> dolphin talked about this and and you again did touch on it um, I, I did steer us back to the questions, but I'll, I'll read you what Robert wrote, but uh, maybe Sensei Dolphin can, can chip in as well. He just said, I'd like to know everything about Shinkin no Daibo. What drove you to invent a kata? 
How did you actually form it? And honestly, what's it like to invent a kata when you're watching it become something that goes around the world? Oh, well, well thank you. <laughs> Again, that makes me feel, you know, very touched. You know, and I, I, you know, at my own dojo, I probably got 40 people who, who've learned it, 30, 40 black belts and have learned it. And, and uh, some, you know, still practice, most of them still practice it. But I go up to London, Ontario, and there's 150 people <laughs> doing it, you know, you know in, a, in a gym and I'm helping lead. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, you know, oh, uh, this is uh, kind of inspiring, you know. Um, but uh, again, I still remember being on Oakwood Avenue in uh, Toronto with Caesar, and I was helping him. Uh, he was showing me the form he was working on to take out for national competition. And he's saying, what do you think of this versus this? And I would give him my opinion. I said, well, you know, here, I think this would look better. And then I gave him a couple of ideas and he used those. And then I don't know if he, you know, fine. but, you know, he had a, a routine that, you know, he took all over in the, in the uh, 80s. He was probably the premier uh, guy. Uh, I was lucky enough to beat him a few times. And many times I was, we, I, I remember a couple of competitions where we had four ties, you know, and, oh. and you know, and run off a four, you know, and, you know, and, and uh, uh, they couldn't decide, who, you know, who, who was going to get it. Well, sometimes I took it and sometimes he took it. It was, um, but I still remember trying to uh, say, now, okay, he put together this, what can I put together? And what are my influences? And my influences were the different forms that I learned in this, my style. And then um, I also watched Pat McCarthy do this, not maybe not the form, you know, that was uh, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and I brought one or two little things from the Naginata form. And I, almost everything is right out of uh, 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 the Chatnyara or Tokamini, it's, it's called in our style. Um, uh, and um, uh, Shishibo and, uh, and uh, Yurashibo, which are uh, the three uh, uh, forms in our system. And then I put the pieces together in what made the most sense. Mm. And I started with the more advanced form and then went into some of the others and strung them together. And uh, uh, and then, you know, then I had to compete against Caesar. And I, oh, I mean, I, I still remember uh, being in Montreal and Jean Frenet is wearing a little, you know, a cape and with the Superman on it. And I've got to go against him doing a aerial cartwheels. And uh, you know, I go out with the with the Bokata and and there's about three thousand people in the in the auditorium. And I watched him go out and he did did, you know, Eye of the Tiger or something. And then, you know, I said, How can I do this? I don't have music, I don't have this, I don't have that. And I looked and I use the whole space. I mean, I used, you know, as much as I could. And I, you know, worked towards the judges and I worked towards the audience. And I looked, you know, and I, oh, you know, it's like, I'm doing it and I'm putting, you know, the, the tip of the bow, you know, that far away from, you know, some uh, poor spectator, like who's back like this, and, you know, and then I, I'm like giving a little wink to her and then continue <laughs> on and doing a little thing. And the audience is just going absolutely crazy. And in the end, I, you know, um, I get the grand champion award and, you know, and John Fernand takes second. <laughs> and it was just like, oh, you know, I, I can do this. I can do this. You know, so, you know, I think audience testing, you know, if you, uh, the audience will tell you if you're uh, reaching them. Hmm. And you have to reach them not just with the form, uh, but you have to emotionally reach them to where they go like, what was that? You know, and I think sudden changes, directions, you know, explosiveness, you know, your full focus and attention. I was just, you know, somebody, Robert Perry or some of the guys from Michigan uh, said to me just recently, they uh, said, you know, uh, maybe it was Richard Plowden said, you've got to watch, you know, I said to one of his students, I told my student, you have to watch Bill Adams. And and uh, and the students said, why? Says, because when he does a form, he does a form. I mean, it is so intense. And, you know, I think that intensity um, uh, is what I help, you know, uh, help propel me to the top of, of the forms in the fighting division. I, but I was the fighter first. And then and, and then uh, I was winning all these fighting competitions and I beat Billy Blanks and I beat Alphonse Gabby Dahl and I did this guy. And, you know, um, only guys, I remember beating, uh, uh, you know, Sam Roberts from, uh, from uh, Syracuse once and he was a spectacular fighter. And I still remember, you know, fighting all these people. And, uh, and then 
uh, I competed in forms and I took like second or third and I was just like, and so I went back and worked really hard on my forms. And then I went, you know, and then after doing that for a while, this is probably the early eighties, uh, you know, as maybe 83 or something, I went out and I tried to do a, a weapons form and I did okay. I took like fourth or fifth. And, um, but it was like, you know, or maybe third, I don't know, but I was just like, I was just so upset with myself. I took it back in and I, you know, I, I said, I've got to get really good at this. And, you know, and so suddenly I was winning in all three. Uh, but I do know that it took off my, uh, my fighting wasn't quite as good. Mm. Uh, where when I only focused on the fighting, um, my fighting was ex extraordinary. When I started broadening out, I think um, I uh, lost uh, some of the fighting intensity. I, know, I think it's hard to work at forms and um, keep your fighting at the peak. And, and fighting was evolving in, in that time period. Mm. It was changing. It was, you know, and I, and I think if you're only working at that, you can focus on that. But I think if you're doing all three, it's, it's, it's difficult. But then, well, I know, love the idea. But I had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. I love that you focused. And I also, um, I think for everyone listening, you just gave a bit of a clinic if they go back and re-listen to that on ways to approach kata, especially for tournament. Before we go to our, our, our closing loop, which we do, and I'll, I'll tell you about Sensei, if you haven't um, caught up on our episodes, Sensei Dofan, I know that this is a favorite kata of yours. I know it's a favorite kata of yours, not even weapons kata, just favorite kata period. Do you want to talk about your relationship at all to that? Uh, I just uh, will tell a story. I remember, I think uh, Sensei Adams will probably also remember this. Like a of all the cutouts I do, that's one of the ones I've, it's in the top three for number of times I've done it. I've done it in Sense of Suino's Dojo. I think he remembers me doing it where, you know, students were ducking down as uh, Sense I was talking about it. But I'll, I'll tell you one of my favorite times I ever did it, Sean, was in Buffalo. And I was there with Sensei Byron and I was teaching and after we had a break, everybody had left the floor and I was on the dojo by myself, which is kind of unusual. And I grabbed the bow. And at that time in that dojo, Sensei Adams, the spectator part of the dojo was like, you know, it was like a balcony that you looked down because you walked up above the change rooms. And so I was doing Shinken no Daibo and I just felt somebody looking at me and watching me. And I looked up there and since Adams was standing up there watching me do Shinken no Daibo. And for me, that's just a good moment that he had shown me that kata. And I, I do have to say that Sensei Byron helped me with that kata tremendously over the years as well. But it was just really nice to be doing that in his dojo, not asked, um, yeah. thinking you're doing it alone. And there's the person who invented it up in the balcony watching you do it it's an amazing kata if you ever had a chance to see it i would encourage everybody to to watch it well i will tell you that uh, both you and scott did very well by it and and it's done well by you i mean i watch you guys and uh you know i my kudos uh, you, you certainly put the effort in and, and uh you, you gave uh, a little bit of your own spirit to it it looks mm. tremendous and, and you know and uh it makes me proud Thank you. That's so badass. I'm glad I got to watch that. Um, Sensei, what we do at the end of our show is we go what I call round the horn. So we're going to start with Hanchi Legacy and go through and we're all just going to say a little something about our time with you tonight. And then the last word will go to you before a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Hanchi Legacy, do you want to say anything about our evening tonight? That was a great evening. It brought me back in time. I remember as a beginner watching Bill do what he said he was doing. Mainly with me was... Uh, weaponry and kata, he's Ishinru katas. They were inspiring. I was always a bit uh, jealous because I could never do what he did. He was, a, he was and is still an extreme martial artist. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that uh, we became really, really lifetime friends. Thanks, Hanchi. Yeah. Sensei Suino? We'll talk about a legacy. I have heard and seen Shinken no Dai Bo uh, as long as I've known the legacies um, and seen it done in many, many places. It's just amazing how, how you can have an influence like that. It starts with one person 
training others, uh, like many things in the martial arts, uh, you know, you change lives one step at a time. And I just, I know that's been a, I mean, uh, since the Adams, you know, I've heard your name and I've seen your, seen your kata for 25, 30 years now. It's pretty cool. Oh, thank you. Since you fan? Since Adams, I always write a bunch of notes. I know you know that I listen and I try and learn from the teachers, but uh, I just, I want to talk about a couple of things that I wrote down here, which is, uh, you're the first one that said that Elvis brought you into karate. I really like that. I'm a big <laughs> fan of the king and I'm ah. really happy that you said that. That's really cool. And, uh, uh, you know, I've only ever thought of you as just an incredible martial artist, but it was nice to talk to you today and hear you talk about your youth and just your athletic background, you know, being 12 years old and jumping five foot 12, like that's just incredible to think about you as an athlete doing those things. Um, I never tire of hearing you talk about uh, your stories with uh, Oyama sensei or Yamaguchi sensei. And, but tonight, the thing that I took away from it was uh, the high voices right? The, the high-pitched voices, which that was a new little wrinkle to the story this time. Um, but I really like the idea of somebody talking to Yamaguchi-sensei, and he doesn't speak any English, and he's just saying, yes, 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 I, I like that. Um, uh, also interesting, you know, it's really clear that uh, you and Sensei Legacy and uh, Sensei Burkowski and those people from that era all have a really strong relationship. Like uh, Hanchi McCarthy has sent in messages uh, on this call tonight. We have like many, many people watching. So as I said, uh, Al Panekia, uh, Hanchi Burkowski is on the call, uh, Sensei Conrad Copeland, Doug Knispel. I mentioned John Pearson, a blast from the past from back in the seventies is on the call. I see uh, Peter Gilpin, Sensei Peter Gilpin's on the call, and I don't think we've ever had him on the call before. So thanks so much. And Sensei Sam Waletsky, and I think that's a testament to you that you have all these, these people from back then who are interested to hear you uh, today. Um, you know, I, 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 go ahead. No, I, I just, I, I was going to say about the brass rails and going there with Gary Hills and, and Sensei Burkowski. It's, uh, that's something that only you would have the confidence to say. <laughs> it's interesting that one of your first black belts and one of Hanshi Burkowski's first black belts were married. Um, again, simple words, what would God say? Great job, right? Uh, I like that you mentioned Alexander the Great as a martial artist and on a martial arts show. As a historian, it was really nice to hear Alexander the Great's name mentioned. Um, also, 24,000 square foot dojo. That's pretty impressive. I mean, size matters, right? 24,000 square, square foot dojo. Um, in the true sense of the word, as a true sensei, uh, you said your greatest achievement is your students. That's, uh, that's great. Um, the thing about Shinken no Daibo, and I love it and the connection to you, but it's really nice to hear that connection to Hanchi Burkowski. I never, ever had that mm -hmm. link before, but now I do that. It was Hanshi Burkowski's competition and him innovating that led you to innovate. And then probably neither of you would have thought that, you know, 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, somebody like me would still be doing that same kata. Um, I like that you said, we can't be said enough. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Thanks so much, Sensei, uh, for coming on here tonight. Sean, I don't know. Who goes next? You? Um, well, Sensei, Sensei, did you just want to chip in on one thought there? Because we, we will give you the closing word as well. Oh, I, I just, you know, uh, so many smiles were brought to me tonight. Uh, you know, and uh, it was, I mean, the people, you, some of the people you just mentioned, have been longtime friends. Conway Copeland, I mean, I ju judged him when he was, he was uh, coming up. And, and you know, I don't think I ever, I think it maybe we did some forms competition, but I don't think I ever had a chance to spawn him. But, you know, certainly uh, Peter Gilpin and I sparred many times and for grand championships and, you know, so many people, Steve Wooslis from, you know, there's so many people that are, are uh, fantastic martial arts that I've had the chance to, uh, to come across or brush across, and, you know, that our paths have met. And I think, you know, uh, I'm so grateful, you know, for that, um, 
maybe my friend uh, Mark Tujoro's family having that um, uh, store that, you know, the Kadancha books were there and, you know, that inspired me and, and uh, Elvis uh, ins inspired me. And then, you know, uh, Masayama, and then actually meeting him and meeting Gogen Yamaguchi, meeting all these people, you know, I, I wanted to know all about what I did and, you know, and why I did it. And I wanted to meet, you know, who, what was the, who were the best and, you know, why were they the best and why did they, you know, become what they were. And I think it was just as important as, uh, you know, as being good. Uh, you know, I, I was important that I, I, I brush up against all these people because, you know, they, they inspired me. And I want to, you know, I, I'm very thankful, you know, um, that all these, you know, people were in my life. Well, since that's that's actually one of the things I wrote down, I, I, I wrote down all the names. And one thing I really appreciated tonight was how many of the names you mentioned in the least non-droppy way a person could, but just because of the respect you have for the people right. that influenced you, the people you trained with. We heard so many names tonight that haven't yet been mentioned on the show. And I just thought, what a gift that you gave tonight to what I think is the fundamental principle of maybe, maybe arguably what we're doing here, which is the living history. And, you know, a lot of those people won't be around anymore and some of them will. And it, it was really special the way you gave breath to their names and, and it mattered to you that they were considered alongside. Yeah, we all know Bruce Lee's influential, but you named a lot of other people who, who we haven't heard about yet. And so I really appreciate that. And, and since they already said the other thing I really took away was in a very relaxed way, without any old school access to grind, I love that you just say it the way you see it. Um, it's a really cool thing to just be like, I didn't like that or that guy, whatever. And, 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 and it, do, it doesn't feel like it's, it's petty or resentful. It's just your perspective. And it's a lovely thing to get our guests perspective. So I just want to say thanks for that. And I, again, I know you just said a bit, but do, do you want to take us home with the last thing before Sensei tells us about our next few weeks? Uh, no, I really want to know about the next few weeks. I, you know, I'm going to try and get people to become more part of this. You know, um, the fact that it's on a Thursday night is one of the uh, nights that I'm, I'll try and make myself uh, more free so I can come on here. And, and it sounds like some of the people that I have great respect for have already been on here. Um, so, I, you know, I'm very you know, pleased that, you know, that they are. And I'm going to have to go through the archives now. And I, I hope anybody who just joined us tonight for the first time, because it was me and they, and they wanted to know a little bit more about me, we'll go back through the archives and, and find out about all the other people uh, that uh, uh, were part of the past uh, conferences. I'm going to make uh, this, um, this Zoom format uh, and it's, um, I'm going to make sure that it's part of my uh, next few months to go back and see what's been done and then continue to watch when I can. I'll, I'll be popping on once in a while on a Thursday night. Um, to make sure that uh, I get a chance to find out things that I didn't know. Because you know what? A lot of people didn't know some of the, you know, some of my history because you're just sparring against them. You're just fighting against them. Yep. You know, you, you don't, you know, uh, uh, I can tell you that, you know, the people I shared those experiences with, you know, so they can kind of verify everything. You know, I, I had a great, you know, martial arts life. Uh, and I'm so lucky that, uh, you know, uh, hopefully now I got a chance to share a little bit with people. We appreciate it very much. And I think you'll enjoy the catalog. Sensei Dolphin, do you want, I, I know there's a special thing you want to say and also uh, fill us in for the three weeks following or Sensei Sweeno can. There's a couple of things. I want to tell Sensei Adams that he should really get cracking because if he starts watching today, he's got a hundred hours plus of, <laughs> of history to get through right now because that's about how many hours of YouTube uh, interview and talks we have out there now it's over 100 hours so wow yeah so you're not going to binge watch it this weekend mm. or maybe you will <laughs> but, maybe uh, you will that you <laughs> um, know of the other interesting <laughs> thing that i wanted to ask since adams before i do the special announcement is would that by chance be a, a legacy Sharon Rue Matsumura Challenge medal hanging on your picture behind your I head? I believe it is. Yeah, I recognize that crest. Uh, um, yeah, I believe it is. <laughs> yeah. and I I just, mean, listen, I, I, you, you guys, you know, you guys are part of my life, you know, and uh, an important part. So, yes. 
Thank you for putting that up there, since I really appreciate that. Oh, it's it's up there all the time. I didn't put it up special today. <laughs> okay, well, in my mind, it went up special today, and it's also, <laughs> it's also proud for me to know that it's up there all the time. But um, I'm actually going to let Sensuino talk about the two guests that we have because he knows them better. But before we get to that, uh, many of us have received messages about a former guest and somebody who everybody knows, who's Sensei Chuck Merriman who's been in the hospital since the beginning of July. So whatever your faith is or whatever you believe, if you could be sending some warm thoughts his way or some prayers his way, um, just this whole community should rally around people like that and help to support them. He gave so much and has given so much and continues to give so much. If we can give even a little bit back, I know that would be valuable for them. So, and I'm just going to, Chuck it over to Sensei Sfino to talk about the two guests that we have. It's Judo Week next time. Uh, indeed, indeed. I believe we are off next Thursday. Yes. And the Which following came Thursday. so quickly. Our break came so fast. Yeah. These three just flew by. Right, 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 right. Um, and right, confirmed for me, we are out. We're off September 2nd as well. Yes. All right. And then we launch into Judo Month. Um, well, the two dates I know of, September 16th, we're hosting Al Panakia, who is a, one of the most regular uh, viewers of this show that exists. Also, uh, uh, just an absolutely wonderful guy and um, a man who has had an incredible judo history. So, and uh, I only know a little bit about that. We're going to know a lot more after September 16th. That's that September 23rd. Uh, Francis Glaze Sensei, one of the top USJF kata coaches and likely to be one of the top referees uh, uh, in, US, in US judo um, and just a wonderful human being. It's really cool to know somebody personally who is uh, one, of the, one of the most preeminent women in judo uh, in, in the United States. Uh, she was recently at JMAC doing a kata clinic for us and it went really, really well. Um, those are the two dates I know about. I know we were batting about one other possible guest uh, in September, Randy. I don't know where that, where that stands. It stands right now that we're going to do a host chat on the 9th, which is going to be fun anyway. Cool. Uh, that's always one of my favorite ones. Is mm -hmm. when we just all chat. Yeah. In, unless that guest surfaces and then we'll change it. But yeah. right now, I hope he doesn't because I'd rather just have a host <laughs> chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Um, and, and thanks for that, Sensei Dofa. And um, yeah, all, all our love to Sensei Merriman and, and, and to you as well, Sensei Adams, for coming tonight. Everybody, we so appreciate you logging in, listening, liking on the YouTube or smashing that subscribe button. Uh, this journey we're all taking together is super rad. And uh, it's just a real pleasure to have you. We'll see you in uh, a number of weeks. Sensei Dofa. Don't forget to thank Robert and all the mm, people. Yeah. yeah. Stuff, man oh, like I, yes let's find the exact name so i don't make them up um because we have people who run the show and it doesn't work without them and they're behind the scenes and they don't get the credit and i do forget them too often so thanks for that sensei um we just want to thank robert schlumsky we want to thank mike russell victoria feth justin shea alden adair and andre Sedeshev, who who keep the social media going the actual technical going we appreciate it so much. Thanks, Thanks Sensei. Everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Sensei Adams. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy. Thank you. Good night, Bill.